<laughs> hey friends, my name is Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show, and today is a very special episode. Today it's all about the, my personal best, my Speaker Hall of Fame, or Wall of Fame, whatever we're going to call this thing. These are the ones that have stood out. I started out as a high-end audio salesman. I transitioned into being a reviewer. I've heard hundreds of speakers, probably over a thousand sets of speakers. Now. To be perfectly honest, most of them are instantly forgettable because they're competent. They're good speakers. I've reviewed, reviewed or owned very, very few speakers that were just bad. They, they have different qualities, each of them, but they're good, you know. But this list, this is the list of the ones that jump out of the deck over this long experience I have of being in the audio business. So some of the speakers are going to be uh, long out of production, so those will be vintage speakers, and some of them will be models that you can still buy, and some of them are vintage that actually are still in production in some form or another. So there's a lot of crossover there. <clears throat> and this is going to be a two-episode deal. So today's episode is about speakers that retail for under $1,000 a pair. And then part two of this will be speakers over $1,000 a pair. So, oh, so the first speaker. The first speaker uh, is a vintage speaker. It's the NHT Super 2. Skinny, floor-standing speaker. They came with these black laminated cabinet, cabinets. Just, I don't know, very basic, very purposeful in their design, but fun. Every time I listened to those speakers, I had a good time. You know, good bass, nice top, they image really well. Just fun. I, I just so enjoyed my time with those speakers. So, NHT made a lot of different models and was in and out of business many, many times, but that's the one that sticks out for me. Another speaker that's, uh, I guess, it's still around in some form is the original or early generation Wharfdale Diamonds. Little stand mount bookshelf speaker. Another one that just sort of hit it. Now that has a more British take on sound than the NHT. It's, it's sweeter sounding, as I recall. It's been a long, long time but a fun speaker. And I remember Roy Hall from Music Hall, he was the original uh, distributor of them, and he just, he was selling them by the boatload. They were cute, small, two ways. And that's a theme that runs through a lot of these speakers is they just click. The, the, the consumers, now I have had a lot of choices as, as a reviewer, but consumers, especially in those days when people went to stores to hear things before they bought them, consumers you know, looked at a wall of speakers. Why did they pick some more consistently? It wasn't that they sounded better necessarily. I think that's part of it, but I think it's also that they just clicked. They just had the right set of qualities, of looks, of features, of sound that just stood out from everything else. Another vintage one is the Lin Can. Now, I own Lin Cans. I had them in my sort of living room slash, slash kitchen when I lived in Manhattan. It's a two-way speaker. It's sort of the size of a LS35A, and it had Lin qualities to the extreme of rhythm and pace, of get up and go. It was, again, I'm sorry to keep repeating myself so early in this, but fun. You just tapped your toes. You were, you were grooving to the music when you listened to a Lin can, and it was just this nondescript black, flat black cabinet. It didn't look fancy or anything. It just exemplified British sound of that time, of, of that thing, of rhythm and pace and engagement with the listener. Great speaker. And those speakers, by the way, though it's a UK company, Lynn, they were making them here in Brooklyn. So my pair was made here in my hometown. Coming closer to the present, the Pioneer SPBS 22 LR bookshelf speakers designed by Andrew Jones when he was still a Pioneer. I don't know, I think they're, sound, they're still in production, I believe. Small bookshelf speaker that, you know, is much more current than these previous speakers I just referred to. It's more transparent, it's more coherent, it's just a better speaker. One of my neighbors in my building right here bought them, I helped her set it up. She was amazed that for such a small investment, the speaker just blows her away. And uh, it, it had that thing, it just keeps going and going and going because it just sounds right. Shortly after the Pioneer experience, he, he left Pioneer, Andrew left Pioneer and went to 
ELAC America. And the very first ELAC, the debut speaker, the debut B6, was a giant leap forward over the Pioneer. It was more expensive. Uh, it's, it's now called the B6.2, but it's just it's just mind-boggling to me how good today's speakers can be for so little money in terms of just being such a well-balanced design of having a reasonably flat frequency response, great imaging, really nice bass. It does it all, and it does it for so little, such a small investment. It's just a great, great speaker. The B6 was good, really good. And when I first heard the replacement, the 6.2, I was like, mm, I don't know, but it grew on me over time. It is actually a, a significant improvement over the B6. It's now the 6.2, and yep, he did it again. But Andrew didn't stop, right? He, his very next speaker for ELAC uh, in the early days was the Unify UB5 with a concentric mid-range driver, mid-range and tweeter in one driver, and a five-inch woofer. Great bass for a small box, incredible imaging, in, in a superior refinement over the debut speaker, killer. And now we have the current version of that, the UB52, and that one <laughs> is even better. It's livelier sounding, it's more fun. And I'm sure that even 10 years from now, I'll look back into this period of the 2020s and say, yeah, he had it, he had it together, man. Andrew knocked them out of the park and doing it at very affordable prices. And I've talked about this one a lot in these roundups that I've done, but the Magnapan LRS, the little ribbon speaker, a full range uh, ribbon speaker, as the name implies, it's about four feet tall. It's super remarkably transparent. It is $650 pair. It is made in the USA. It is a bona fide audiophile speaker for a very affordable price. There is a catch. They don't want to be jammed up against the wall. You gotta have them two, three feet away from the wall behind them. You have to use it with a good amplifier, meaning one that has serious current output, can drive four ohm loads, blah, blah, blah. But it is staggering in what it does. But on the other side of the tracks, in speakers that changed everything for me, was the Klipsch RP600M, small bookshelf speaker with a horn-loaded tweeter, and that speaker was the one that sucked me into the horn sound and clipches in a big way, but it really started with that one. It's still in production, a modern classic, truly, and it started, uh, Klipsch has been around since 1946, but this one sort of kicked them into the next phase of popularity and just making better and better speakers at very affordable prices. And of course, just coming in under $1,000 is the Zoo Dirty Weekend. It's a company based in Utah. They build the speakers in Utah. It uses a full range 10 inch driver that goes up to about, I think, 10K and then it has a tweeter. Uh, it's super easy to drive. It's very dynamic. It's, I think it's actually pretty darn beautiful and just it has something. Now I've, I'm going to talk about another Zoo speaker in the next episode, the over $1,000 range. But the Dirty Weekend is just one of those perfect audiophile starter speakers. It just is the kind of thing that's like you can grow with it. You can you know, use better and better electronics and just hear more and more from your music. It's that kind of speaker. And people just love that company. Sean Casey, Mr. Zoo himself, is, is, is such a hands-on person in running his company and building his speakers and doing shows when we had shows, and just an amazing guy. And when people meet him, <laughs> they just say, yeah, I want your speakers. They're that good. It just, just has, they just have some kind of magic. And the last speaker on the list goes back to my time in the 70s and 80s. It's the Vandersteen 1, well, I think it's now called the 1C, but the Vandersteen Model 1. Small floor standing speaker, and it has, especially back then, a more open sound than, typical, than a typical box speaker sound. And uh, I, I'll also talk about its bigger brother, the Vandersteen Model 2, in the next episode, but 
the one just doesn't sound like a box. And when people heard that back then, yep, it was one of those, yeah, I want, I want those, right? I liked them so much I bought them for my sister. I bought a pair for my sister because she's not an audiophile, but she was saying, hey, Steve, I need a speaker. I said, I'll just buy you these speakers. So I got her a pair of Vandersteen ones. That concludes this roundup for part one. But in part two, we will do, we will look at over $1,000 speakers. But again, I want to hear your choices of what you think based on your personal experience of the best speakers you've heard in your life, the ones that jump out that you've owned or heard or your friend had or something like that, that you just fell in love with and you just, they're stuck there. They're stuck in your memory of great, great experiences. My name is Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show. If you dig it, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. We're coming up on 150,000 subscribers. That'll happen, I think, sometime in early November. Uh, so we, we still have room for you. Still, you can still join us. Plenty of room here. Uh, beyond that, well, you should check out my Patreon, which can be found at P A T R E O N. Dot com and I will link to that directly below. And by the way, Patreon now accepts payment in dollars, pounds, and euros, or, or euros. And what else? While you're here, check out the playlist. There's playlists for speaker reviews, about 90 or so. Uh, speaker reviews, headphone reviews, music reviews, electronics reviews. And, but for now, I can say my work here is at last complete. Thank you so much for watching. And I really do hope to see you back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.